Hello, everybody, and welcome to a town hall edition with the WIA president and CEO, Jonathan Adelstein, and he is on the phone with us. And uh, how are you doing today, Jonathan? Doing great, Stork. I'm glad to hear you're doing well, too, and I uh, hope everybody out there is feeling, feeling good, safe, and uh, hanging, hanging in there. Jonathan, uh, really trying time in America as we're all kind of uh, held tight here in our homes and trying to get ready. But some pieces of the of what we do, and that is trying to build a 5G network, are taking off. But I'm sure the big news is is uh, normally we are preparing and getting ready to uh, head south to a, to a big show and everything. And I'll let you take it from there. What are we going to do about Connect X? Well, Stork, we're so disappointed we can't gather and in person so many great events have been postponed or canceled and connect x is no exception we just weren't safe to do it in in may so we are planning to keep the industry together online we don't want to give up to this virus we want to fight back we want to bring everybody together it's a virtual conference that we're planning we're going to kick it off on may 19th when we should have been down in in miami and you know the most tragic thing stork uh the miami convention center where we were supposed to be is being turned into a, a, a hospital, literally. The, the field where we were supposed to be hosting booths is going to be a place where people are going to be in bed trying to recover, God willing, from this virus. I mean, it's just unbelievable what's happening in our country, and, and, and we're the ones, I think, on the front lines trying to help get things back together, but, you know, one of the many sacrifices has been our ability to get together for the for the show. But, but you know, the virtual event's going to be, I think, tremendous opportunity to get the message out about what's happening, you know, on the ground. What, what are the big, you know, dogs in the business saying about how they're going to move forward? And we're, we're trying to get the CEOs of not just the tower codes, but the, uh, the carriers, and we're trying to get the top people from, from DISH to, to fill us in. Basically, we want to hear what the plans are for deployment. Where's the capital going? When's it going to flow? When are we going to be getting back to 100% work in the field? I mean, we're hearing mixed things about how busy folks are out there. Some are busy, some are not. Uh, and we want to get everybody cranked up again to make sure they're doing their work, doing it safely. And we'll talk about how that's going to get done at this virtual Connect X. And, you know, uh, some of those carriers have talked about that they're going to, you know, I know Verizon came on and was on uh, one of the news channels and basically just said that we're going to increase our CapEx and uh, add more. And even though we're going to have a short time to implement that CapEx, aren't we, Jonathan? Well, that's right. I mean, they're actually cranking it up. We're seeing industries across the country dial back, and our industry is going to be really dialing up between – what Verizon said about its CapEx, at and is moving forward. T-Mobile's about hopefully to turn it on here as they're, they're wrapping up the, the merger with the state of California. Uh, everything is coming together um, for a really dramatic, I think, summer for everybody. But right now, you know, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag out there. Not everybody's at full tilt yet, and, um, and they're trying to work through permitting issues we've been trying to help them with. But what we'd like to do at this um, Virtual Connect X, we're calling it, Connect X all access, like an all access pass, you know, me, a rock and roll guy. Uh, in this case, we're offering all access to everybody for free, free registration. We want to make sure that in this difficult time, um, when, when cash is tight for some folks, we get everybody on so we can bring everybody together, get even a bigger audience than, than, than ever because you don't have to fly to Miami, but everybody can tune in. Um, a lot of people are probably still stuck in their, in their homes at that point, and uh, they'll be able to tune in May 19th or do it later, but to hear from, from folks about what their, what their CapEx plans are. Well, and content is king, and we need that content. We live off that content. That's how we respond to what these guys are doing. They keep their, their plans close to the vest and then uh, contact normally the vendors that they've worked with in the past, the solid connections and family that they have. What's, uh, you know, Jonathan, uh, as, as we're in this time and everything, We've got a lot of small vendors that are in this industry and everything. What are some things that we can be doing or anything that you're hearing that, you know, uh, and I'm just, let's give an example. I'm a small site act or an engineering company or environmental company, and I give help, but now I'm kind of locked up, and we know these small loans are kicking in, but uh, 
is there going to be anything we can do to, 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 you know, move these bodies into position where we can help them, you know, get work quickly, so to speak? Yeah, well, we haven't put it out publicly, but we're going to do what's called our traditional supplier diversity summit. Right after the event on May 19th, we're going to host through WIA one-on-one -on -one meetings with uh, the carriers, with the, the tower codes, with the procurement officers. Normally, we do it in person down in Miami, right, but uh, right. we're going virtual, and we'll have sort of uh, speed dating, you know, so you can get in line with different companies that are putting out the biggest contracts. If you're a small business, uh, minority-owned, women-owned, veteran-owned, small, uh, a chance for the, the carriers to, I think, demonstrate their commitment to supplier diversity. And the tower codes are all engaged as well. Uh, so we're really excited to get everybody together. At least that's the part we can play. And it's worked in the past. And we've done this for the last uh, three years, and we've heard a lot of real contracts are coming out of it. And it's tough. You know, you're right. I think that the players that – in this situation that have been developed the, the closest relationships are the ones that are in the best position. It's kind of hard to develop new relationships when you're, when you're basically stuck in home and you're, you're trying to get your marketing done from your, from your bedroom, you know, it's not the same. So people tend to go to folks they know, uh, here's a chance. I think one of the rare opportunities we have to develop new relationships. So uh, be sure to stay, you know, in touch with our, with our website. We'll be announcing shortly this supplier diversity summit, um, which we had planned for ConnectX on the ConnectX All Access version. Uh, 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, they're all technologies that run, and, and now we're getting into 5G, they're all technologies, Jonathan, that run across the same frequencies we've been using forever and actually pushing out the lowest wattage power we've ever pushed out since the first phone call in 1983. And, you know, to say COVID-19 or, you know, 5G or related or the, the RF transmission, I mean, I can't imagine what 5G could do if we had that network in place. And I'll let you take it from there. Well, yeah, it's going to be more important than ever. I mean, first of all, as people are stuck at home or seeing, you know, increased demands, 5G is a lot more efficient, so it helps us meet this increased demand, which is wonderful, uh, but it also enables all these new applications. I mean, for example, you can turn an ambulance into a, a, a 3D virtual emergency room, whereas before you had to wait to get in there, the doctor, if there's a really critical situation, can help uh, right there in, in the ambulance. I mean, the, the possibilities of connected devices with people being monitored, a uh, number of different functions. I mean, the telehealth applications alone are mind-blowing, um, and, and we can't get them out there fast enough. So, you know, the irony is, I think you, you were mentioning some of this scare tactics people are linking 5G to COVID-19. Not only is that complete BS and no basis and just an outright lie, but it's tragic because 5G and wireless in general right now is being used every day to save lives. I mean, it's, wireless is being used for these calls to to 911, it's being used uh, for that FaceTime call with your doctor since you can't visit them in person to determine, hey, I'm having some issues breathing. Can I get in to see, um, should I go to the emergency room or is that actually a higher risk? Well, they're using their wireless service for that. So people's lives are being saved every day. And there are irresponsible people out there saying that, oh my gosh, 5G's behind this or 5G's causing these health issues, which is completely debunked by every major health organization globally and in the United States, from the FCC to the, you know, to the, to the FDA, to the CDC, everybody's saying this is not real, WHO. But it, what we do see is real. What we do see every day, what we see practical, tangible evidence of is a life-saving capacity, is the public safety. When a first responder goes into a building and has an opportunity through the FirstNet network to download the blueprints to the building and know where he's going in and know what the dangers are protecting our first responders as they're going in. I mean, so how irresponsible is it for people to be saying that this is anything but life-saving technology when the proof is there and instead they're focusing on these false lies, some of which are coming out of Russia, consciously trying to slow us down on 5G so they can, you know, undercut our, our, our innovative economy while they just see their economy tank because they can't really produce anything of, of technological value or any innovation so I know, let's come up with some fake rumor, use the Internet, 
to stir it up and, you know, Americans will buy this crap. Well, we're not buying it. You know, we can't let that slow us down. And it's not going to, it's not going to slow us down because everybody from Fauci to, you know, the, the White House is ready to debunk this kind of thing and help us to move forward. We're getting a lot of support from policymakers to help make sure that 5G rolls out despite this, this coronavirus crisis that we're facing. As a matter of fact, they're figuring out what they can do to double down on it. Wow, wow. You know, and, and that speaks to our new player. You know, T-Mobile is in the process of uh, taking over uh, the Sprint and, and the coveted uh, uh, frequency that they hold and going to try to deploy it. But we got a new character that's going to play in the arena, and they've got a three-prong approach that a lot of people are talking about, you know, and Charlie Arrigan and Dish. And, you know, you're hearing that he's got a program where he's got to go through the 30,000 leases that he's going to be looking at, decide which ones he wants to do with that. Then he's going to be looking at T-Mobile and Sprint are double double co-located on the same tower, the same asset. One goes away. Do I want it? Do I not want it? Do we want to end services there? And then he's going to have to have a new build team, and this all requires transport and coordination. Charlie's hiring some people, isn't he, Jonathan? There is so much activity going on in the networks with the new dish build um, being considered and developed uh, with T-Mobile reconfiguring its network to take into account the how does it combine with Sprint and build the best of both networks to be really efficient. Uh, I mean, it's really an exciting time for for, for the engineering world uh, that we represent um, and, and for the build world that we represent at WIA. I mean, we're seeing great opportunities. I think people would like to see them come faster and sooner. You know, they want to see this big get opened up now, but it's going to take some time. And everybody's facing financial challenges, and, you know, we have to make sure there's a business case for all this to, to justify this level of investment. But it's, it's going to come. It's just a matter of when and hopefully sooner rather than later. And we're trying to clear some of the hurdles at WIA to getting that done, at least in terms of the permitting side and the siting side. Temporarily, we've been seeing some setbacks with permitting with understandable reasons. I mean, it's tough for localities when they're going virtual, they're going home, working from home, if they don't have mechanisms in place to do online permitting and to do remote inspections, it's kind of tough for them to um, get these approved. So we're working in a cooperative way with municipalities to see if there are some really best practice methods they can use to uh, to get these permits unstuck, you know, to keep them moving if they can. And we understand, you know, if there's situations that they're facing that are just life and death, they've got other priorities, trying to get ventilators and new hospital set up but you know they come to the industry and they say we got a new health care facility set up here in this convention center or, or wherever it might be and we need connectivity and the industry is stepping up we we see the carriers putting cows in putting in fiber lines and uh and we need to make sure as that new equipment's being deployed for those emergency uses that we get the permits to get it done and generally they're good about some of those things if they're asking for it but you know frankly we have a lot of things where we're trying to deal with some of these capacity demands that we're seeing and deal with the consumer's needs. And we need to get those permits approved too. And uh, we're, I think, seeing a lot of cooperation from municipalities saying they get it. At least their national organizations get it. They're helping us work through on a case-by-case basis the local issues that we're seeing. So, uh, you know, it's a collaborative effort well underway here. And uh, we're really excited about uh, about trying to open up those permits where they're being held up. And, and I should say that a lot of communities are keeping it going. There's a lot of progress that they're making, um, you know, in, in a lot of communities that already have in place mechanisms for, um, for doing it electronically, those permits are moving forward. So we're trying to bring all the communities up to the same sort of high level that we're seeing in, in, in some that are, let's say, you know, more automated because um, it's tough to do this if you don't have those mechanisms in place. And it's tough to create them if you don't have them already. So what we're doing is going to municipalities and saying, here's here's what's working. Um, here's some municipalities that are doing it well, and they're helping us identify the ones that are working well and just giving those as a resource. And sort of the, the, they're doing a good job of, of talking amongst themselves, trying to exchange what's working. Trying, and, and we as industry are offering help to those municipalities that – that need it if they want our help with, you know, to get a drone to do a remote inspection or to get a lawyer to help them figure out how to work through some of the legal issues they have with their open meeting rules or whatever, whatever we can do to help. 
we understand they're on their heels like everybody else and maybe even actually definitely even more so i mean they're really uh faced with some life and death challenges right now and we're counting on them to to keep us all safe we think that we're part of that you know it's all we're all on the same team here we're trying as industry to provide life-saving bandwidth and if it's not life-saving it's certainly sanity saving for those of us who have kids at home you know trying to learn <laughs> or get schoolwork done um you know, uh, or, or get remote shopping done, whatever it is we're trying to do, or just entertainment to keep from going crazy. I mean, we got to keep keep that that data flowing because you never know if somebody's somebody's video gaming and they're sucking up the bandwidth. But you need, you know, somebody else needs to make an emergency call. This entire network now has become public safety. This entire network is a public health network, along with everything else. So let's keep the permits going. Let's do it in a way that's respectful to the localities. Let's uh, work together cooperatively. That's what that's what's happening. Well, and and you said it best. It's all about education, and that's what you guys do there in Washington D.C. for us. And you know, I'm holding here in my hand an old uh, an old Dragon Wave uh, radio that uh, was used during the Clearwire deployment and everything. The deployed, a, tried to get 134 million customers. They went into 80 markets, and that's the coveted frequency, kids. That uh, that uh, T-Mobile really wanted was that that clear wire frequency because it, it it is a mean animal. If you can get it built, it'll it'll really haul the data, won't it? Oh my gosh, yeah, the two dot five. Yes, sir. It is a sweet spot. You know, the beachfront moves. It's kind of funny. It's like uh, you know, it used to be used to be lower lower bands, and and all of a sudden we're seeing that the mid band. Is kind of perfect for the yep. for the data flow and the, with the denser networks. Um, Two dot five is a sweet spot. So T-Mobile is very fortunate to come into such a large cache of of, of frequencies at, at at just the right spot at just the right time. You know the the high band is exciting too. I mean this is used to be junk spectrum. It Worthless. did. It, it was. It was. It was called the PIN. applications. If you can get the antenna real close to the end user um, without any you know, obstacles between them, you can get huge amounts of bandwidth um, at very high frequencies that weren't even usable. In even when I was back on the FCC, we didn't even think about what could be done. I suppose a few engineers were thinking about it, but wasn't on our radar screen as regulators. We're always, of course, as regulators the last to know. But <laughs> oh my gosh, what's happening now is beautiful. You know, so we are we're, we're seeing a just the need to densify the network all around. Whether all these frequencies require more antennas. Than, um, than some of the lower lower bands. And the lower bands work well, too. I mean, T-Mobile's taking the 600 megahertz and doing huge uh, lengths of, of, of sort of wide area coverage on 5G and doing it really quickly. So a lot of different technologies are being used, a lot of different um, frequencies with different characteristics are all coming together to provide levels of bandwidth that people are demanding, you know, and what build it and they will come. I mean, it's, we've, we see that every time. It's hard to keep up with consumer demand, and 5G is going to open up whole new types of applications that are going to be using the network and putting demands on the network, and 5G will be not only opening up what what happens every time, like with 4G, all of a sudden you open a video and then demand just crushes the network, and you got to build more and more to keep up, and 5G is going to be the same. I mean, we're going to open up new applications. At the same time, we open up whole new amounts of, of bandwidth through the efficiency of the network and through just the, the capacity of, of 5G, and that will all fill up, and then it will be time for 6G. So we're never going to be bored in this industry, that's for sure, Stork. Well, I want to I want to wrap it up with, with one question is, and that is, do you hear of any new players such as uh, Amazon, and I'm not trying to divulge anything you might know or anything, but uh, with you working uh, on the Hill and everything and with the FCC continuing to release good frequency that we can use that's up and down, um, you know, do you see a new player possibly coming to us, Jonathan? Well, you know, I, I, everybody talks about it, and you kind of see people sniffing around. Yeah. My, my theory is that if one of these big players really wanted something, we would have seen them bid on Sprint, right? Yeah. I mean, that was there. And it was at a, at a cost. A fix, that they a could fixed cost. It. Fixed cost. So, I mean, as far as you knew what you were going to get into, it wasn't just like you're buying frequency at an auction coach and you're just bidding, bidding, bidding. You knew what you were going to pay for. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of talk about Dish doing a wholesale type network. 
that would be available to them, um, which would be exciting. Um, I mean, it could even be an acquisition, but, I, you know, who knows? I right. Mean, it's very speculative. Yeah. Um, but certainly these big companies have the capital to very quickly do that. But, you know, they could have they could have come in. You would, you would have thought if they were so interested in having their own network, you would have seen a bid for Sprint. Yeah. Yeah, and there was no interest that I heard of. At least nothing reported. No, I didn't hear even any buzz about it. So would they be kicking the tires if that's what they had in mind? Because that was in their um, within their um, capital uh, possibility. They had the money to do it. And but you know, I think maybe if they could find somebody that's in the business, they don't want to go in the business. But maybe a wholesale arrangement with a with a dish wholesale arrangements, they'll probably compete out with other carriers as well get additional capacity from 5G. Um, do they want to control their own network? I, I don't know. I mean, there's talk about it, but just proof's in the pudding. You know, we're waiting to see. Well, a lot of, you know, a lot of different things going on. You know, you got uh, carriers now looking at rooftops where they kind of steered away from them. They're kind of caught in a situation. It's either, you know, take the rooftop and, and, and shoot it downward to where a hot spot is. They got to be where the people are. It's just a, a it's, it's, it's changed. And now you got to, you got to kind of build the network around the people. And uh, we got a lot of work to do, don't we, Jonathan? Yeah, it's a fun time. I mean, you know, it's a terrible time, and it's a fun time to see that we're going to have an industry that rises and grows, even if the rest of the economy sinks into a real, uh, real malaise, which is well, certainly and- possible. I mean, nobody knows for sure what's going to happen in the economy, but it's not looking great right now for a quick recovery. It hopefully will, but whatever happens with the rest of the economy, I think wireless will continue to move forward. I mean, we're seeing some of our some of our big wireless infrastructure publicly traded companies at all-time highs. In the oh, middle that's, that's of great. Otherwise, difficult time. Well, and, you know, that's just what you – let's finish out there. You know, people. We're going to need people. So if there's a, a college student-to-be or somebody that wants to get into wireless, I mean, we can't talk enough about what wireless does and what 4G and the jobs it sprouted, I mean, and mutated from it, and the ripple effect of that, Jonathan, 5G is just going to be much bigger, isn't it? I think it is. We had a real labor shortage going into this. Things were super tight. We couldn't get enough crews, couldn't get enough people interested, and we were talking about recruiting into our industry. All of a sudden, we have, you know, another 5 million people today. Every day, millions more filing for uh Unemployment, man, every yeah. day, but I mean, it's just been tragic what's been happening. And hopefully, a lot of those jobs will come back, but some of them won't. And we're here growing. What an opportunity to offer them to yep. say, why don't you reskill, retool, and come into our industry? We're not going anywhere. We're going to keep growing. And we'll train you. I think we need to find a way to get them trained. We have our telecommunications industry registered apprenticeship program, or TIRAP. Our apprenticeship is a perfect vehicle for getting people in. We're trying to find federal resources for our employers that are parts of TIRAP to help pay for their training. Let's hand them, you know, our employers an easy handbook as to how to get people up to speed quickly that's worked for other companies. And we have industry collaborating through TIRAP on, on what works in terms of training, mentoring, guides, um, and, and then help the employers to attract these people into our industry, train them up. Again, you know, WI has created the telecommunications education center as well we're really stepping up in workforce development because we see that the most important thing we have our resource is our is our people i mean we have to have people that know how to do this know how to do it well get it done right the first time get it done safely uh and because we we had sort of a a lack of academic uh training going on no schools were teaching what we do so we've partnered with places like aiken and uh We've got five other schools now that we're partnering with around the country, and Nate's partnering with some <clears throat> schools. We're working with them in, in South Dakota and in uh, North Carolina. Let's, let's get all these schools teaching all the different skills, from tower climb and a small cell to RF 101, so that we can have people coming out of the schools and doing this, but not just kids going through school. I mean, people that are coming from other industries. This is our chance to bring in some fresh blood into our industry as we're growing and we're going to continue to grow and keep them here, you know, keep training them, give them long-term career growth opportunities. I think we have a great future ahead. It's going to be a rough patch right now for us and everybody else, but we're well-positioned as an industry to continue to grow, and we're going to need 
um, I think that fresh blood to grow along with us. Jonathan, anything else you'd like to add as we wrap up? And uh, hopefully I might get to talk to you. I'd like to see is what I'd like to do. But just by the way, personally, what have you been doing? Have you been playing the harmonica? What have you been doing with your some of your free time? Are you a binge watcher on TV, or what have you been doing? Well, yeah, it's a great question. I, You know, I, I love playing with you, and we, you helped us uh, get music together uh, at our events, and we're so disappointed the band plan can't play for everybody at uh, at our virtual show because it's just not a good platform. But I've been playing piano. I've been really, really? trying to play keyboard. And what I found, my teacher told me, I've got a piano teacher, you know, and, and I'm old here and trying to get the ref, left and right side of my brain working together. So um, it's tough because I, you know, it was pretty rudimentary skills and I'm, I'm getting better and better at it. Uh, but what he told me is that it's better to do three-minute chunks and just practice a little bit throughout the week rather than just trying to do it all in a big hour-long practice session. So, you know, right after this, I might go down there and plink away a little bit at some Neil Young songs I'm working on. Good. He taught me a few things on, and then they're getting really good. They're getting much better because I just do little bite-sized chunks. You know, the piano's downstairs. Don't have in the office, but I walk by the piano. I can't resist maybe five minutes on this thing. And then a little later this afternoon, I might do another five minutes. So by the end of the day, even if I get 20, 30 minutes on the thing, that's way more than I used to do, and it's all in different little pieces. So it is the ideal way, it turns out, I see what he's saying now, to learn, um, just making it kind of natural, just having fun, a few minutes, relax a little, forget about all the troubles of this world, and hear some beautiful melodies, and work on some simple triads, and trying to get the left hand and right hand going together, and Man, if I can learn piano coming out of this, at least something good will come out of this hellish experience. Well, uh, you know, I watched that special on Miles Davis. It was on Netflix. It just came out. And, you know, just the way he transitioned from note to note, it's just so smooth. You know, it's just not done, and that's where you want to get to. It's not only playing, but it's where you move around and nobody knows you're moving. That's, that's what the key is. Yeah, he had. I saw that too, actually, and uh, I don't want to end up like that. No, <laughs> he, he, kind of went through a no, no, you know, patches. whoa, he uh, he poured it to his body. He didn't. Uh, he didn't let off the hammer any. I mean, but man, uh, after the throat operation, and still to come back and uh, uh, man, he played with a lot of great people. But boy, he had an attitude too. You know, he did have attitude, but in the end, he did come back strong after a little, you know, difficult period with. Yep all the drugs and the surgery and, uh, but boy, uh, what a, what a legacy of, of tastefulness, you know, and that's, that's what I try to do on the piano. It's something that I like to hear, you know, cause I'm pretty picky about my music. So if I can sound good to myself, that's the hard part. Um, yeah, uh, well, sometimes I actually do other times I discuss myself. So the goal is to get better and I'm definitely improving way more than I was when I had to go to the office for most of the day. And then by the time I got home, I didn't feel like doing much and, Let's wrap now it up. It just keeps me going. Uh, the show. Uh, what 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 do we need to do as people a part of the Wireless Infrastructure Association? Courts could be free for everybody, which you know that's a big deal with the travel and everything. You're opening it up. It's. Uh, are we going to just basically register username whatever, just so you get an account of all the people and and whatever you want to sign up? What when are we going to start seeing more about this and and the, give us the start date again, Jonathan? I want to give you a plug on that. It starts on May 19th. We'll, we'll open up registration soon. We're, we're putting together the sort of uh, panels right now, uh, putting together the keynotes and all that, so we should have more information on that shortly. It's a had to make a quick transition. I wish we could have actually announced this earlier. We kind of had yeah. the sense that there's no way we're going to be able to do the event in Miami and keep our people safe, but we had to negotiate with all our venues and get that shut down um, so we didn't end up paying hotels for all this money instead of using the money to pay for advocacy, which is you know right. every dime we get from this event that we're now losing is money that was supposed to go to our lawyers to fight for the industry and making sure we get good laws and regulations so we can deploy these networks. Um, but we still are here for the industry. We're just going to do it for free. Um, we want people to see what's going on. We want to continue to convene the industry together. And we really are asking the, the leaders of industry, those who have the fattest wallets, to come on and tell us what they're going to do with them. So everybody out there th figuring out what they're going to do with their business has, has some good um, – insight and getting telegraphed of what's what's coming next and when it's coming so that's our goal is to is to help our businesses get some visibility 
into the future deployment uh, plans of, of the biggest players in the industry. And we're going to bring all that together. We'll be able to make more announcements on that shortly. So thanks for giving me the chance to fill you in on that. And thanks, everybody, for your patience with that. Okay. Uh, if we get a chance to talk again or whatever, we may come back and do a little plug or whatever. I'll give you some time to work on that. But until then... Jonathan Adelstein, folks, uh, the WIA president and CEO with his uh, State of the Union, and we'll be back soon. See you then.